Hello, welcome to Hattrick. I'm Jordan Dyler Coltman, joined this week by Elliot Tanti. Braden is not with us. We're kind of trading off. I get each of you now kind of like one on one every other week. This is great, Elliot. It's been a couple weeks. How you doing? Happy New Year. I mean, the real question is, how do you know we're not just the same person? I, I don't, I suppose. It isn't. It, it is an audio medium, so uh, you could be distorting your voice. I I I wanted to ask you this because I I know I just led with it and I said Happy New Year. But like, what is the cutoff? When can you when do you have to stop saying Happy New Year? So like I January fifth or no? I'm quite liberal about this. Generally, the first time I'll see someone and then you're quite year. liberal about a lot of things. Yes, yeah, about a lot of things, but particularly about this. Generally, if it's the first time I'm seeing someone in the new year, I will say Happy New Year to them. Uh, and but, that like, what extend, about in March? Because that it's the first time you've seen them. To the end okay. Of okay. Okay. Yeah, I would say first time you see someone till the end till January thirty first, it's appropriate to say Happy New Year. After that, it becomes a little tedious. Okay. All right. Well, in that case, Happy New Year. Welcome back. Let's get to it. Here's topic one. Okay. So obviously, we have to start with um, Wild Card Weekend. It's one of the most. Uh, jam-packed weekends of sport in the calendar. Uh, a lot of people would argue it's one of the best weekends of sport, especially if you're an NFL fan. There's certainly a lot to choose from or simply not to choose and just plunk your butt down on a couch and watch football all weekend because there's two games Saturday, three games Sunday, and we we obviously won't talk about Monday yet because it hasn't happened, but there's also a Monday night game. So the NFL has certainly done a great job of monopolizing this weekend in January, and we had lots of good football. Uh, I assume you watched some. I don't know how, how much you watched. Uh, you can get into that in a second, but we'll, we'll, maybe we'll start with this. Of, of all the games uh, this weekend, or at least all the games you saw, what 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 jumped out for you? Who, what was the best matchup? What was the best storyline? Or what was the best sort of outcome for you? Uh, well, if you'd asked me uh, an hour ago, I would have told you Jacksonville and the Chargers was a great story and a great game and really exciting and obviously I guess the underdog, Jacksonville was the underdog. I don't know. They were close. Um, was probably the best the story of the night or of the weekend. But it's hard to top what just happened in the Cincinnati game with the Ravens on the one-yard line and not only fumbling it, but the fumble return being returned 98 yards um, and ultimately being the difference in the game. Uh, those are the types of swings that – those are the things that we love about football, the types of swings and momentum, the way the game can just change on a dime. A really – like it was, it was the most basic thing. They were, they, the play basically revolved around uh, a QB sneak. And generally when you do that, there's two ways to do it. You either go over the top or you try and kind of break down, uh, you know, get through the line. Um, but if you're going over the top, you need to have protection behind you because what happened could happen. The ball could go backwards and you need someone to pick it up. However, uh, there was a miscommunication, I guess. And so all the people that were supposed to be behind the quarterback ended up uh, around him trying to jam through the line. And next thing you know, it's in a Cincinnati player's hands and going down the other side. So that was a really exciting piece. Uh, Two things I want to touch on that you sort of one you raised and one just to continue on monopolizing this weekend. It's so great that we don't have to choose between games. I think it's really smart what the NFL has done here. You're starting to see them sort of creep into Saturdays. And I wonder if that's not something that we're going to start to see more and more. Of course, you know, they were impacted by Christmas and the holiday season this year and New Year's. So that certainly had an impact on it. But Saturdays seem to kind of work for the league. And uh, on a weekend like this, where you can just literally watch every game, and that's all you have to do, you don't have to choose. For football fans, I think that's a great thing. The other thing I want to raise, and it, yeah, I'm beginning to sound like a broken yecker, record, um, yeckard, year to year, yeckard, I'm <laughs> broken yeckard, year to year, is that, you know, we, we've yet to see Monday, and outside of the San Francisco-Seattle game, I mean, this is wildcard weekend, this is when there's the most disparity between teams playing in terms of their rankings, um, Should be. and we've seen a bunch of really close, exciting games. And the parity in this league is just unbelievable, particularly at the top. And I just think we're done with dominating seasons. Like there's certainly going to be teams that are better than other teams and teams that are really poor. Um, But when you get into the upper echelons in the playoffs, the NFL is just a really exciting league to, to watch because everyone is so close. And on any given Sunday or Saturday or Monday or Thursday, 
any team can win. And I think that that's really exciting. I think it's great for the betting markets and that whole new market, but it's also just good for the game and, and, and great for the fans. So that's my takeaway from this weekend. Well, I want to touch on a couple of things you mentioned, because um, I think you made some great points. The 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 point you make about the turnover uh, in the Bengals game being such a pivotal point. I mean, that is what this weekend's all about. It, everything is the margin for error is so small. And occasionally, sure, you have a big, you know, one team gets out to a big lead. Look at the 49ers game. You know, they, they dominated in, in most facets of the game. But the rest of the games were actually quite tight. You got a 34-31 win for the Bills over the Dolphins. That also includes a miscue where the coaching staff thought they had got the first down and thought it was first and 10 and sent out a package prepared for a first and 10 play when they actually were fourth and one. So complete you know, self-inflicted uh, mistake there that cost them dearly. Um, and obviously the emotion of the bills and all of what they've been going through for the last couple of weeks, sort of becoming America's darling team uh, and they get the win there, but it's not, it's not a easy one for them. And then obviously the comeback, you've got the 27 point deficit that the Jaguars overcame becoming the third biggest comeback in playoff history for the NFL. That's a huge one. Um, I was watching the Oilers game Saturday night and sort of flipping back at the commercials or at the intermissions to sort of see how this game was going. I just happened to flip there early in the fourth when the chargers had an opportunity to go up by, or to increase their lead. I think at that point it was like 30, 20 something. And they had uh, a, chance of a field goal from like 30 yards out and missed and uh larice and i both looked at each other and went well i wonder if that'll cost them later and of course they lose by one so that was a huge uh, uh missed opportunity but they also blew a 27 point lead so it's not like one field goal was going to be the difference there uh and then i think it's also great to see a team like the giants who have been kind of a bit of an up and down team go up against a team that's been really strong in the Vikings. But that's what's fun about this weekend. There's so many storylines. There's so much drama there. We've got a huge matchup tomorrow in, in terms of like name and marquee when you've got the Cowboys, America's team versus Tom Brady, you know, America's quarterback. So um, all of that's there uh, and a lot of fun. So, you know, I think football does that. I wanted to touch on what you said about Saturday, though, um, because I think it's interesting. You're right. The NFL's very good when it goes on Saturdays, but it's also pretty good on Thursdays and it's great on Mondays. And it feels like we're very slowly, especially with the number of weeks now that exist in the season with the number of broadcasters and streamers that all want a piece of this action with the like never ending, you know, cash cow that the NFL has become for so many other uh, of its partners. It feels like we're not far away from football every night of the week. And I could see that happening where we start going, all right, well, the Monday night kind of creeps into a Tuesday night game a couple of times a season. And then maybe we do a Wednesday night special thing. And then slowly we just kind of accept that we're just going to play football every day of the week. And I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily bad business for the NFL. They certainly would have eyeballs on their TVs and on their streaming platforms and whatever else you're going to get, you know, the, the NFL package or whatever the, the, red zone or whatever the pack i can't remember the name of the bloody thing or whatever on youtube next year instead of on um uh, on direct tv or whatever the previous one was so the 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 sunday night ticket that's what it was so you know you're gonna have all this stuff sort of moving more and more into the streaming world and into sort of surrounding your audience and every single part of how they're media infrastructure uh exists and i think that the nfl just slowly knows that as a brand they have they're pretty much untouchable when it comes to making content and people consuming it. Nothing's going to really so far, very little of what they have tried has failed. You know, even these games in Europe or these games in Mexico, they still make a lot of money doing them, even if, you know, not everyone's a huge fan of it. So um, they can do no wrong business wise right now. Well, and I think the only thing that the only criticism that the NFL's really faced from a broadcasting standpoint uh, in over the years is generally the Thursday night matchup tends to be kind of terrible. And we saw that again this year, like the first six or seven were like either terrible games because the teams were terrible or the scores were terrible or the weather was terrible. And when you start to diversify the nights that you play, you start to move away from that reputational hit, whether that's true or not. The Thursday nighter always gets kind of cast as like, it's going to be a shitty game. And uh, so, you know, I wonder if that's not motivating their decisions as well too, from a reputational standpoint, because that is something that we we saw it again this year, but has been a long time coming. And we've been talking about that for a long time. So yeah, smart business and smart, smart marketing. And um, I mean, it's hard to argue with the statement. The NFL is the most entertaining league uh, of the big four. Well, it's certainly, it's certainly the most successful when it comes to how their product is being 
consumed en masse and they figured out the gambling and they figured out all of the the tertiary businesses that are all surrounded around it. Let's really quickly play a, a, a fun little game of what's coming next. We obviously don't know the outcome of the Cowboys Bucks, so we'll leave that game. The winner of that game will face the 49ers next Sunday uh, in the afternoon game. Let's go through the other three matchups we do know for the divisional round, and you can just give me a quick sort of hit on each one, whether you want to pick a winner or not is up to you. But just what do you think? We've got the Jaguars Chiefs. Obviously, the Jags coming off a huge win. you got Trevor Lawrence up against Patrick Mahomes. That's the first game up on Saturday. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it'll be a great game. I I, I mean, I think Jacksonville has kind of gotten um, – this is good for them. This is good. They're, they're a young team. They're a growing team. I think getting to this stage and playing that caliber of team on this kind of stage is going to be good for them. Do I think they're going to win? No. Kansas City is a better team. Uh, they've been there before. You can never bet against Patrick Mahomes in that offense. I understand it's not what it used to be, but that's still a good team. Uh, I'm sure that they are going, the odds makers are going to be giving uh, the edge to Kansas City and that, and it'd be really hard to bet against them. But I really like Jacksonville, and it's certainly a team to watch into the future. And uh, I had Trevor Lawrence in my fantasy this year, and he was very good down the stretch. Uh, Certainly someone to watch. Uh, Following that game, 5.15 p.m. Saturday, if you're on the Pacific Coast, you've got the New York Giants and the Philadelphia Eagles. So a big New York-Philadelphia matchup there. Obviously, Philly winning the division, so that's a big game. What do you think? Do the Giants have a little bit more magic in them? Can they can they compete with what the Eagles have had? And obviously, the Eagles giving Jalen Hurts an extra week to rest because they got the bye. Maybe uh, we see a little bit of that sort of Eagles magic from earlier in the season back. What do you think? Yeah, it's interesting. They really, they kind of fell off a cliff. I know some of that's, that's injuries. Some of it's, they didn't need to play all their best players. I always am hesitant though. We saw this to start the season. Not a lot of teams played their best players through the preseason. And arguably the first couple of weeks of the NFL season were kind of terrible. And I know teams are going to be reevaluating this year, uh, that next year. But I wonder how, if you haven't played a meaningful game for a long time, that seems to disproportionately impact NFL teams compared to other sports. And so my only question is, is Philadelphia going to be up and ready for this game? They should be favored. They are on paper, the better team, but you just wonder if you haven't played meaningful football in what, like a month, is that going to impact you? It could. And so that's one of the things I could be watching for. And that could be a really close and exciting game. because of that. Well, it's for, for my eyes, it's going to really depend on whether or not Philadelphia can slow down Saquon Barker. Barkley, because he had two TDs, uh, fifty-three yards, and only nine carries. When you're when you're efficient in that regard, um, I mean, Daniel Jones had more carries than Saquon Barkley, and Saquon Barkley had two touchdowns. So he's making short work of the time he's getting with the ball. And and Daniel Jones threw for over three hundred yards today too. So with two touchdown passing. So you know that team don't don't sleep on those Giants. They're they're a very good football team right now, um, and have been playing really really well. All right, the the. Um, last one that we know of, sorry, is obviously the rematch of the Monday night game that never got played. So this game will be in Atlanta um, because it was set to be at a neutral site because these teams did not get to compete for the division uh, during the their final game together. Obviously, knowing we all know why. Um, so the Bengals and the Bills. And this is an interesting one. There's going to be a lot of emotion going into this one. You've got um, a lot to play for. And obviously for the Bills, this is a big hurdle because they believe... Um, that this is their year and they have to get past, you know, the Bengals who were went all the way to the final or to the, you know, to the Super Bowl last year. So um, what do you think? This Bills, has Bengals. Come, this has got to be the marquee matchup of the weekend, regardless of what happens tomorrow on Monday night. I, I think that this, this game is going to be uh, really interesting, really emotional for all the reasons that you said. Um, these are two really great teams. And I think the Bills are uh, really awesome and really fun to watch, but, as is Cincinnati. Um, and so I think this is a really close matchup. It's going to, if, if there, if you can only watch one next weekend, this is the game to watch for sure. All right. And as we said, we don't yet know what the Sunday night cap will be there. It'll be the 49ers versus either the Dallas Cowboys or the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We'll talk about them in just a second for now. Let's leave it there. That's topic one. Okay, Elliot, it is time for our pick of the week presented by BetStamp. BetStamp is your one-stop shop for line shopping, bet tracking, and sports betting odds. You would never just go with your first place, you uh, the first price you find when you were shopping for flights, so why would you settle for the first odds you find when betting? BetStamp changes that. They have a streamlined and easy-to-use app that allows you to find a wide spectrum of odds for any bet, 
Then it makes it easy to track your bets all in one place. You can set alerts in case the line changes and you can learn what bets your friends and even some celebrity bettors are making. So, Elliot, would you like to tell us what our pick of the week is this week? Yeah, absolutely. I'm thrilled by this. I, uh, you know, I'm known for taking the underdog. I love taking the underdog. And uh, with our wonderful sponsor here, I can find the best odds when I take the take the underdog. So I'm going to be doing that this week and on Monday night. And I get to pick Tom Brady as an underdog this week, which just seems crazy to me. Tom Brady in the playoffs is money. And so I'm going to make money by betting on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers over Dallas Cowboys tomorrow night, Monday night. What are my odds? Go ahead. Well, as I said, so if you head over to BetStamp right now, you're going to see that the best odds you can find are at play now uh, at plus 125, um, which is a substantially better um, line than if you were to say go to power play where you'd only get a plus 110. So uh, again, going to BetStamp, you can find all of these odds. You've got a whole spectrum of them across all the different platforms, giving you the best opportunity. So if you want to join us this week, put a little money on the Buccaneers. You can download the BetStamp app for free and please use the code ordinary when you set up your account so that they know we sent you. To always get the best value when you are betting, choose BetStamp. <clears throat> okay, Elliot, this is topic two here. And obviously you weren't with us last week. Um, you haven't been with us for a few weeks because we didn't have a show uh, since uh, mid-December, I think is the last time we actually spoke. So a lot has happened. I wanted to do kind of like a, a little run around the NHL. I've got a couple sort of grab bag style stories, little tidbits from the news and things that have kind of come up. Just get your thoughts, get your perspective on a few of them. Um, we're not going to go in depth on any specific team or anything like that, but there is a lot of news. There's a lot of different stuff that's kind of happened already through the new year. Obviously, you know, being Oiler fans, and we've talked a lot about the Oilers here, there's a lot of... Um, there's just a lot of different storylines you could dig into with the Oilers. They've had some ups, they've had some downs, they've gone on these roller coaster games where they get up by two and then blow a lead. And now, in the last week or so, after a frustrating loss to the LA Kings in LA, they've gone on a three game winning streak. Obviously, two of those games against bottom of the table teams in San Jose and Anaheim, but they made those games look like they were dominating teams that they should be dominating, which is something we've also seen the Oilers struggle to do in the past. Um, but they put up uh, seven goals back-to-back uh, -back nights, and you had very, very solid performances out of Jack Campbell, including almost a shutout in San Jose and what should have probably been a shutout in San Jose by all, uh, in all fairness, after facing, I think, something up like upwards of 28, 30 shots. So that's a reasonable number of shots to, to be putting up there. And then they go into Vegas and they have an absolutely playoff-style atmosphere in there. It felt like a really important game for both teams. And the Oilers were able to cling on to a one goal lead uh, that they went into the third period with and they walked out of the third period with, which is something we have not seen them do um, consistently enough this season. And to do that against the top of the table in the division is really, really impressive. So let's start with the Oilers right now. Um, I've got two sort of things on them, but I'll give you the first the first crack at sort of the consistency part here. Are, are the Edmonton Oilers right now still figuring out who they are? Or is there something fundamentally broken that they have to now figure out how to fix? Is this a team that's just trying to get it together like we saw last year where they obviously had a coaching change and they'd gone on like a 20 games sort of spill where they just couldn't string wings together. And then all of a sudden they went on a run and all the way to the Western Conference Finals. Or is something fundamentally broken? No, I don't think anything's fundamentally broken. I think the team has been impacted uh, by the injury to Evander Kane. And that's really changed the dynamic in the way that the team looks. I think he was really meant to carry, particularly with the um, uh, with the departure of Zach Cassian in, in the offseason last year, he was really meant to be that sort of toughness piece. Uh, and, and, and obviously, you know, he's a top six forward. And we all saw what he did when he came to the team last year. Like he, he is a dramatic impact uh, and, and had a dramatic impact to start the season too. And I think that, no, we haven't taken into account just how much of a loss that is for this team. Uh, and, you know, I know we can always point to, you have Leon Dreisaitl and Connor, Mc, Connor McDavid and Nuge is a 20 goal scorer this year. Um, but there is still something missing there. And I think the team's been just out of sync because he's not there and they don't have that consistent player there doing, you know, the things that Evander Kane does. So do I think anything's fundamentally broken? No, but I do think that that, that piece has been really missing and they've really struggled to find a consistent game around it. When they do play 
the kind of hockey that they can play, they can do amazing things like beat teams seven, one, six, nothing or six, two, um, and get out really difficult wins against really difficult teams. You mentioned Vegas, but there was also a game they won two, one against Calgary a couple of weeks back. That was a real mature effort. And that's again, against a team that they're going to come up against if they intend to win the division and go, um, on a run again this year. So there is the capacity there to do it. If if the, if it was fundamentally broken, I don't think you'd be seeing those wins. I think they're starting to put it together. This team has traditionally been better after Christmas. Uh, their stars, if you can believe it, uh, have traditionally been better after Christmas, particularly Connor McDavid. If you can get even better than he's already is, he's on pace for like, what, 70 goals this year, 68 goals, something like that. So, yeah. you know, there's lots of reasons to think that they're going to put this together and figure it out. I don't think it's a fundamentally broken thing. I think it's just they've been struggling to find their identity as a team with, with some so, pieces. So let's jump to another piece of that to ties into that, which is another one of these notes I wanted to sort of pull out of the bag here. So, yes, I think the Oilers are struggling without just the the, the multifaceted style of hockey that a guy like Evander Kane brings. He's an offensive power forward who can be physical in the corners, who can muck it up in the circle. You know, he's not afraid to throw his body weight around or his fists around. He's a mature player in terms of the length of time he's been in the league. He makes, for the most part, pretty good decisions out there. He's certainly an energy guy that this team seems to feed off of. And obviously, you know, what we saw from him last year at his best is an incredible asset for the Oilers to have. Yep. You're right. That's a big hole to fill. And obviously with the cap space, there hasn't been like they can go out and get one guy to do it. But there is one guy right now for the Edmonton Oilers who's doing an amazing job of trying to fill some of that hole and doing a very, very good job, you know, grabbing the hard hat, grabbing the shovel and going to work every game. He's got nine goals on the season, four assists for 13 points through 29 games, which is already a career high for him. And I would like to make the argument that with the exception of signing Zach Hyman, the trade at the beginning of this year to get Clem Costin might be one of Holland's best decisions as a general manager. Underrated trade in terms of what the expectations of this young guy were, but the impact he's having on this team, not just on the score sheet, but just the energy he seems to provide on the ice. He's like Evander Kane Jr. You know, he's like little, little Kane out there. He's a big guy. He puts his body in, in the right places in the corners. He's physical. He, we saw him the other night jump in and have a fight when you know, the team needed a little bit of an emotional backup after they were kind of getting pushed around by the Ducks after the Ducks were clearly out of a hockey game. He wasn't afraid to stand up for his teammates. He's had four goals in the last three games. He's had six points in the last three games. Um, they, you know, he had some time up on the top line with McDavid. Didn't really work out, but he seems to be fitting in really nicely in that second and third line. And now that they've been doing that 11 and seven structure, he's getting more ice time. I would like to make the argument that Klim Kossin might be one of the most underrated pieces of this team and one of the more important ones right now. I don't know, man. You don't live in Edmonton. He's pretty highly rated here right now, but I would say yes. I think the deal itself particularly when it happened, we all just kind of shrugged and said, whatever. And yeah, I was that guy team right away too. Right. Like he, but, but I think from, from that perspective, absolutely. You know, it's funny. You, you compare him to Evander Kane. He does a lot of Evander Kane type things and he's much more skilled than I think any of us thought. And I only just learned that I believe he's a first round draft pick, which you know, maybe speaks to some of that skill and, 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 and talk to that too. You compare him to Evander Kane. He reminds me of when Patrick Maroon joined the Oilers. He's got the same sort of vibe around him. And we all know what Patrick Maroon became after he left the Oilers. Uh, and he became a really important piece on a team that made three Stanley Cup finals and won two of them. And I think he's the type of player that you need, that that middle, you know, top nine, I guess. You'd call him the top nine um, forward that can hit, play, score. Uh, changes the changes the uh, the momentum of games, and he's been a, a great addition. And he's made a case, you know. I believe he's a free agent this year, so whether we're able to keep him or not is another question. But um, at least right now, you have to be really pleased with what he's brought to this team. And I, yeah, I think underrated for sure. I mean, I know I'm in the minority here. I still think Jack Campbell will end up being a major win for the Edmonton Oilers, um, but he certainly hasn't lived up to that at this point. So that's the last sort of couple of days, though, Jack Campbell has started to look like Jack Campbell. Jack. Um, he's played really well. And I thought in that Vegas game, he showed a lot of grit. He made some really important saves, some 
you know, and not just flashy saves, but like the kind of saves that keeps a team that's holding onto a one goal lead in the driver's seat. And I think that this little spurt, and obviously it's kind of unforced in the sense that Stuart Skinner's not hurt. He's at home because he's expecting his child probably has had it by now, but it was sort of personal leave that he took. It gave the opportunity for Campbell to, to come in and forced him to play some hockey. Um, and he did a really good job in those two blowout wins. I think those games are often hard for goaltenders to sort of stay focused in. Uh, but he made sure that there was no letting the foot off the pedal. And they kind of let him warm up there to that game in Vegas, which was also on a back-to-back night. And I thought he played really, really well. So I'm also in that camp where I think that giving it, given a little bit of time, it would be really nice if the Edmonton Oilers can uh, keep both guys hot and, and, and go into the last quarter here of the season with a real two two goalie tandem that can go and when one guy gets a little bit you know roughed up in one game the other guy can step in and not miss a beat that would be really really important well Let's, and I, um, think, I think there's been sorry. one team this year in the playoffs uh, in the last two years that had run one only started one goalie throughout their entire playoff run yeah in the new modern nhl particularly post covid i don't know what it is i think maybe it's the games the intensity of the games whatever you really need two goalies that can start games and yeah. that's exactly what the oilers are sort of shaping themselves into which is great on my end all right, let's jump to the last two. I, as I said, a bit of a grab bag here, so I'm going to bounce around for a second, but I've got two other coaching stories that I wanted to ask you your opinion on. Um, the first one is kind of, uh, I don't know, it's kind of a difficult story or frustrating story a little bit. Uh, we heard a little bit about it on the Hockey Night in Canada, but as someone living in Vancouver, it's been interesting to watch in the last week. So for those unfamiliar with where the Canucks are, obviously they're struggling right now. This has not been the season they were hoping for. Um, they're kind of stuck right in that, like, really tricky place in the standings where they're not good enough to compete with the rest of the division, but they're not bad enough to be bottoming out and looking forward to a, a lottery pick. Like, <laughs> yeah. They're kind of stuck in no man's land and they would really have to blow it up to sink themselves far enough down to, you know, catch is the wrong word, but to catch a Chicago or catch a Anaheim who's really, you know, dragging at the bottom. So they're kind of in this limbo and they're not the only the organization isn't just in limbo, but their coach is in limbo. And this is this very unfortunate and uncomfortable story that's sort of developing here where it has become abundantly clear that the Vancouver Canucks have prepared and are prepared to relieve Bruce Boudreau of the head coaching job. They have their chosen candidate picked, but they're in a bit of a contractual problem. So they there is a report, there are multiple reports, I believe now it's up to three or four reports, that Rick Tockett will be the next head coach of the Vancouver Canucks. But the problem is he is currently contracted to TNT as an analyst, and he has to provide them four weeks notice to be relieved of that contract. So apparently the deal's already done. He's already agreed to do it. The Canucks have already basically, you know, gone as far as to make it, you know, unofficially official but they can't pull the trigger and make that move without, you know, waiting for him. So now Boost Brudro is basically a dead man walking. He's, you know, lame duck or whatever you want to call him. He's sitting there coaching a team that he's not actually going to coach in a couple weeks. My frustration or my question, I mean, I'm just, I, I don't understand what the logic here is for the Vancouver Canucks, why they aren't just going to pull the trigger here, say, thanks, Bruce, you're done. Let one of their assistant coaches be the interim until they can get talking behind the bench. I, I mean, Bruce, I guess, is being paid to do the job until he's fired. So you kind of, but it feels, it feels a bit cruel, frankly, uh, just the way that this has worked. We've seen coaches be fired. I mean, Todd McClellan was fired and left alone in an airport when the team got on a charter and flew away from him. Like we've seen pretty ruthless situations like this in the past. I'm not sure if they think this is some kind of mercy they're doing. I don't know what's going on, frankly. And it's weird because you do have like Jim Rutherford and these guys, these are kind of veterans of the NHL. This isn't sort of like a young management core that hasn't been through coaching changes before, but now the story is just turning more and more toxic. And I think the longer that this drags out, the more un unpleasant it looks for the Canucks who already here in Vancouver, I think are becoming more and more, um, you know, not a laughing stock, but definitely the butt of a lot of people's jokes. You know, they're looking at how this team is being run right now and going, these guys just can't get their self together. Yeah. I mean, there, you hear a lot of things uh, outside of Vancouver about Vancouver ownership structure, ownership interference. There's been, you know, the Miller stuff last year, there's been a number of different things that have occurred that lead you to not have a lot of confidence in the way that the team is run. This only adds to it. I mean, I mean, just to push back on your point around, well, you're paying him to, to, to coach. Well, if you fire him, you still have to pay him. So uh, it doesn't, you're paying him one way or another. Why would you add this extra sort of like 
tumult and, and, and frustration around it to, to keep them around. It seems really obvious. The only thing I can think of is there, nowadays, and you saw this with recent changes in Edmonton, uh, you don't just hire a coach. The co- You kind of hire a staff. There's a group of people that sort of come with the coach. Um, you know, it, it looks different depending on the guy and who it is. But um, so you wonder if, okay, you let Bruce Boudreau go how many other guys are dead men walking that are like close to Bruce Boudreau? Like Tockett's presumably going to want to bring in his own guys. Right. And that's something that happens a lot too. Um, so, so maybe that's one of the questions, like you can't leave it to someone else. Cause that other person is basically the same thing. Dead man walking. That's the only thing I can think of. All I can say right now, Jordan, is it feels like there's more going on here than meets the eye or there's more information. Um, it, maybe it is, maybe it's the most obvious thing is just that, this is just a poorly run organization that's making a really boneheaded decision. And, you know, I wouldn't put it past them, frankly, based on everything that we heard and everything I said before, but I guess there's like, there must, there has to be something else going on here. I don't know what it is. And I, I, I think it will be reported on. I mean, um, and, 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 and that's that. And maybe they've got a job for Booz Boudreau in the organization after sometimes that happens too. I don't know. It's like a weird situation. What you've described is, seems really uncomfortable. And if I was a Vancouver Canucks fan, I'd be really frustrated. And I mean, like, I don't know why they're not bottoming out. I just looked at the standings. Like, you know, the teams that they have to crawl over to even get close to even fighting for a, pro- a, a playoff spot at this point, it doesn't even seem to make sense to me. So it, it seems like a mess. And it seems like there's more information here and we don't have the entire story. And we may never get it. Sometimes we do. And that's fun too. And we can talk about it then. But this doesn't make any sense to me. There has to be something else going on. Yeah. All right. Let's leave that one. I got one more for us here to round out this little NHL roundup. Uh, this is kind of a weird one as well. Kind of a fun one too. But if, speaking of uh, Canuck coaches, here's a, here's a story about former Canuck coach and beloved NHL coach, John Tortorella. Uh, John Tortorella banned iPads on the bench Thursday night. So as many of you may know, the NHL has a deal with Apple. They provide iPads that allow players on the bench to have real time replays, let coaches do coaching with with replay because you've got video coaches in the back who are constantly, you know, clipping uh, in real time. Uh, Not unlike you see in an NFL game when a quarterback comes back and they immediately hand him the Microsoft tablet and he sits down with his, you know, receiving coach or his his quarterback coach and they, 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 they review things. So obviously football is a much slower sport <laughs> and you have players coming to the bench and they might sit for four or five minutes while the offense or the defense is on the field in hockey, things happen a lot quicker. Uh, so it's tricky obviously to be doing the real live time replay review video coaching. However, John Tortorella has decided that that will not be the case on the Philadelphia bench anymore. And he has banned the iPads. They removed all of them. Uh, he even said in the press conference, if he could have, he'd be removing the uh, screens that are down by the coach's feet. You probably see every time there's a video review going on or a coach was looking to see if they should challenge for offside or anything like that. He'd like it all gone. Hockey moves too fast. He says he wants to go back to when the players had to be in their heads thinking about the game and not trying to quickly make decisions based on video. Uh, He says there's a place for video coaching. It's in the room. It's not on the bench. Now, here's what's interesting. Uh, First, he called out a very specific player. He said Thomas Konechny or Travis Konechny was the number one culprit, um, which, of course, led to him getting quite uh, viciously teased and people making these little super cuts of every time he was sitting on the bench with the iPad and then, you know, memes of him playing, you know, candy crush or whatever else on the bench. Regardless, here's the thing. They, they are on a, um, they've won six of their last seven games. He removed them on Thursday. They won four, nothing over Buffalo. And then they went on a one, four, one against Washington. So it's working. Clearly it's working. What do you think of this story? I The iPods on the bench have never made any sense to me, particularly for players. I mean, for coaches, you want to look back on a shift. Maybe you missed a guy. Maybe you didn't see something. And you wanted to understand how a play developed and where the mistake was so that you can make a lineup change. I actually think that's great. But players looking at a uh, at an iPad or their last shift, like, doesn't – it, it, it like, like John Tortorella said, the game moves too fast. But also the game is not like set up like sure you play systems and you do cycle and, you know, there are sort of a few set plays sometimes off the draw and things like that, that you can kind of build into your game and maybe on the power play. But the difference between that and something like soccer or football, where, you know, you can learn a lot from the way the the coverage schemes uh, that that teams are deploying um, 
uh, against your offense. Similarly, the, the, the schemes that the offense is playing against your defense, you can start to see where tendencies are and you can start to build up things. What have they changed? What's the change in the game versus what we saw in the pregame film seeing up to that? What does it mean when there's three linebackers versus two in this set package football? That is football. And that, that makes sense to me. Similarly in soccer, there are, uh, the, the deployments of players that shift and change and strategies that change. You see the Canadian team does this all the time in terms of how they press on the left side or the right side and where Alfonso Davies is. And having that information in real time could be really valuable. But hockey just doesn't seem to make sense to me. And if it's a distraction, if you're not focused on the game and what's happening and your next shift and uh, the players on the ice and your opposition and you're looking down at an iPad and your last shift, I, 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 I don't think I hate it. I, I really don't think I hate it. Uh, John Tortorella is a pain in the ass. I hate being on the same side as him on anything. But uh, on this one, I it uh, it makes sense to me. Honestly, it does from a player's perspective. All right, let's leave it there. That's uh, that's topic two. Hey, if you're a fan of Hattrick Sports, then I promise you, you are going to love the Backyard Basketball Podcast. Hattrick's very own Braden Dollar Coltman sits down every Wednesday with his best bud, Christian Steck. And together, they break down all the news, rumors, transactions from around the basketball world. Whether it's the NBA or college hoops, these two guys love talking basketball, and you are going to love listening every Wednesday on the Backyard Basketball Podcast. <laughs> Topic three, um, we're going to leave the field. We're going to leave the ice. We're going to leave the court and we're going to go uh, into uh, uh, the digital world here. We're going to talk a little bit about the proliferation of the sports doc sports documentaries, which of course are not new, um, but they definitely seem to be having a a renaissance, if you will. And to be honest with you, looking at it, I think it's pretty much been going on for the last 20, 30 years in a slow tick, but obviously the way that Netflix and these streaming platforms have um, continued to evolve their business models. The documentary has become a very va- a vital piece of their ecosystem. It, they're cheaper to make than traditional scripted television. They're um, easy to mass produce and consume, and and you can turn them into these longer series. Whether it's you know Drive to Survive on Netflix, or you've seen, um, and now we know Netflix is doing a, a golf one, and they've got a. a um, dr- several other ones, I suppose there's a few of them. And then you've also got the re the re unloading, let's call it, or the re um, publication of these older docs that used to only get aired once a year on ESPN or things like that. Now they have a new platform. So feature docs are there. Um, and we saw obviously during the pandemic, also the huge success of the Michael Jordan doc, which was a bit more athlete driven um, athlete produced. Um, and we're seeing a lot of those too. Tom Brady had a, a similar one. So, you know, Michael Jordan's last dance. And then Tom Brady had a series where he basically was the primary narrative for uh, each episode followed one of the Super Bowls with the Patriots and all of the things going on in his life. It's very much an autobiographical documentary. So that's kind of interesting. But we wanted to spend a minute to just talk about sort of like what we think is driving this and also sort of what what impact uh, is this having in terms of how, you know, sports are being consumed. Uh, I'll lead with this stat, which I think is interesting because I um, I mentioned it already. Drive to Survive, I think, is considered by many to be one of the most sort of impactful uh, of these documentaries in terms of be- being like an additional marketing tool, right? So this isn't just informational. This isn't just entertainment. It has actually brought people to a sport they didn't previously follow at all. Um, and there's metrics to prove this. I mean, the, the, atten- the, 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 the audience for the Bahrain Grand Prix in 2000. Um, 19 was around 875,000 viewers in the United States. In 2021, two seasons after, uh, obviously, the pandemic, which shortened a year, but two seasons into Drive to Survive, that number was 2.23 million, which is larger than the average NBA audience for a, a Wednesday night basketball game in the, on ESPN. Huge numbers for modern television, especially in the age of, you know, every different option, you know, a la carte television, you can watch anything you want anywhere in the world. And that kind of appointment viewing is occurring. Very, very impressive. So I'll start with you, Elliot. Obviously, you know, you've consumed these, you've seen these, um, you've watched this stuff. What, what jumps out at you? What is this about? What, what, why do you think people are so drawn to these stories or what has made them so successful? I don't know. I, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. One, I think for certain sports and for certain like types of sports, they really do well. Like the, the, the format really fits uh, 
uh, the sport and the season or whatever it is. I, I like, like you said, and use the, the Bahrain example, but like drive to survive has revolutionized F1. We'll be talking about this. There, there will be F1 will forever be seen as pre drive to survive post drive to survive in terms of popularity. And like, we'll be talking about this for years. It has completely changed uh, that industry and that sport. And it's great for them. Honestly, like, look, we have a podcast on our network. We would never, ever, ever have thought about doing an uh, F1 podcast uh, when we initially dreamt up the ordinary podcast, you know, however long ago it was. Right. So, so it, it's had considerable impact and, and for them, you know, it, it's a money-making enterprise and it's brought a lot of interest to them. But I think it also F1 really suits it. Like it's big personalities, it's high stakes, uh, it's uh, fast and fun, and there's great storylines, and every year is sort of unique. And you see the two that are emerging uh, this year, one about tennis and one about golf, are very similar because what's interesting is I think it's always been hard for sports fans to follow individual sports the same way that you can follow team sports when you follow a team sport you've got lots of things going on there's multiple you could you could like multiple players you could like multiple aspects of the team you know you're devoted to it because you're maybe it's the city that you grew up in the city that you live in the city your partner's from there's a number of different things individual sports sort of struggle in that way because they don't have that same connection um so this emergence of this golf show and now the tennis one which i've just started watching uh, point break really show not give you like a better insight into the personalities and give you the opportunity to cheer for someone or learn someone's story or get to know them in a in a better way I mean we're, they're talking about players in this tennis one you know you see them once in a while but it's really hard for me to name a tennis player that wasn't Nadal Djokovic or uh, Federer really ultimately and I'm pretty invested in sports and I can actually like tennis but outside of the Grand Slam and those three fellows and Serena obviously um you know, I was not really following it anymore, but now this gives you this, like this, this, this minutia of the sport and the challenges and what does it mean? And, and why is it, why is the grand slam so important? And why does this mean so much to these people? Like the difference in earnings from winning a match versus not winning a match at a grand slam. I had no idea of that until I started watching this show. And I think the golf one's going to be really interesting too, because it's so hard to get your tour card. And people always talk about how difficult it is to make it on the tour of the PGA. This show is going to give, you the example of what it's like to be fighting for your tour status every year on top of the fact that it also mimics what's been this a really interesting time in golf where it's following the emergence of the live tour which i'm sure they're going to get into in these conversations too so i don't know that i answered your question outside of the fact that i think it gives people more access to individual uh sports uh, sports with individual athletes that have uh, that are maybe ch more challenging to get into uh, it allows you to understand the minutia of these sports that you sort of just follow tangentially because they show up in the back half of your sports broadcast and are interesting to watch. And you know they're talented, but you don't really understand why and why it's so difficult. But lastly, it gives you like a second look back on something that you experienced as a sports fan, like the Live Golf Tournament or like, um, you know, last year's uh, uh, Aussie Open that I think really captivates audiences. And, and, and I think it's outstanding. I have more to say on this. Like I, 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 like many people, had a lot of free time over the holidays and digested a lot of streaming sites. Um, and a lot of what I watched was sports focused. A, a great documentary on FIFA, for example. There is so much good content out there where you're starting to learn the intricacies of sports. And as someone who's passionate about sports, but my passion goes beyond how many pucks cross the line. That's just such a great medium to tell stories and sports are stories. Ultimately, that's what we love about it. That's what we talk about it. And that's what's great. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think what has made these very successful is that they are offering windows into something that people already consume. They are a unique perspective uh, on things that people already have an emotional relationship with, especially if it's a sport or an athlete or a team that you already are interested in. And then again, also introducing people to completely new athletes and, and sports that they may not be familiar with. I, I kind of categorize, there's sort of like four of them, um, four types of these things. And I think that that's what's really interesting in terms of how this is structured. Like they really, this is such an easily packaged, sold, purchased, and, and then presented kind of business model from the from the networks and from the streamers and from all of these different producers, you know, you have the embedded ones. You've got these ones like drive survive or the, like the two, the golf and the tennis one you talked about, but it's not unlike what 
you know, Don Metz and the Oilers were doing, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, probably 20 years ago now with like oil change where you had, and that was back on network TV, right? Sportsnet was covering it where you'd have, you know, cameras in the dressing rooms and cameras following players. And you'd every couple of weeks, you'd have this HBO has been doing this for years with boxing, right? Leading up to a big pay-per-view they're, they're embedded. Uh, and it's, it's, it's about uh, giving access to the fans to something, to an event, maybe leading up to event. The HBO one with the NHL was always leading up to the winter classic, right? So they followed those two teams and they got you right in there. HBO also following the boxers leading up to it, but it, you know, the embedded one has had a few different iterations where you have these ones, like what we're seeing now, the prestige ones, I'm going to call them, where you've got them in there for the entire season. And then the, the show comes out almost a year later, like in the, in the, in the drive to survive, we're going to watch, uh, all of these storylines we watched live during the Formula One season, you know, six months later um, through a very specific narrative lens. And obviously, you know, editing and storytelling and writing and all of that's going to go into making each of these individual episodes unique. Then there's also the the sort of more reality TV show style embedded, which is what, you know, I think in many ways the best decision Dana White and the UFC ever made in terms of their business, much like formula one was doing the ultimate fighter where they created a reality TV show where at the end of it, you guy, you know, two, one guy would be would given a contract. He'd, he'd, he'd get to fight in the UFC and that business model worked so well for them, but it really is the same world. We're, we're doing the same thing. We're giving people access. So that's the kind of the embedded one. And then you've got these history or retrospective ones, which is really for me, like the format defining piece of it was 30 for 30 and what ESPN and Bill Simmons, and Connor Shell did over there at at, at ESPN in the, in like the early 2000s, where you know they went and got prestige filmmakers Peter Berg and and you know dozens of guys, and they went out and made 30 documentaries about 30 different stories from the last 30 years. Right, that was the premise. Now they're on, I think, like volume uh, five or six already of these. They've, they've they've got well over 50 of these documentaries, and they're full length documentaries that are all about events that previously happened. So maybe history you didn't know about, maybe a story you thought you knew about, you know, the Gretzky trade or you know the melee or the the malice in the palace and whatever else. And then you've got these kind of more biographical ones we were, we were talking about. Now these athletes are in on it, right? You've got Tom Brady producing his own. And, and now it's about the, the controlling of the narrative, about the athlete wanting to be their own storyteller, right? The same way um, we've seen you know, autobiographies by other celebrities, including princes, where they're designing their own narrative to combat the public perception of themselves, right? Yeah. And that's kind of a big genre too. And then the last one I was going to say, Although I think there's also a subcategory in that, which is like the true crime one, where sometimes we're following individuals where something bad has happened around sports. And there has been some really amazing documentary around that kind of stuff. I'm thinking of Athlete A, which is all about the, the Nasser um, uh, controversy and the, and the scandal and, and assault uh, of, of the gymnastics program in the United States. But the last one I was going to say is like the nuts and bolts, where you have a documentary that's more about like the minutia of how sport works or the corruption within it. And that kind of the true crime fits in there sometimes too. But the FIFA one, for example, is that. So like when you look at it you have this huge ecosystem now you have this huge narrative why does and i know i'm rambling so i'll, I'll wrap it up real quick but like you i've got a lot to say on this because it's fascinating but why does disney invest so much money in marvel it's because of the ip it's because there's a pre-existing content that they know they can churn out content for people like they could re they can throw it in a blender and put it back out there and people are going to consume it again sports is that same kind of thing where the the narrative on the field we talked about in the nfl you got this 27 point deficit they come back they win the football game that's a great narrative right there in and of itself you turn off that football game you get to sit back you say wow that was a great story i just watched two teams going at it great characters on both sides of it it's narrative but then when you get to add the element of all the things you didn't see live all the things you didn't know about these players all the different minutia of what's going on in the background it just adds another element. It's a, you know, you repackage it, you put it back out there and it's just as exciting and entertaining. Well, and I think that these sports are like full of personalities that are larger than life. Whether you own a team, you manage a team, you coach a team, or you're the you're a player playing for the team to get to that level, the highest level of the highest, like the highest echelon of any sport that you're playing. Like you need to be an interesting person to get to that. You have to be you know, incredibly focused, incredibly talented. And there's so much that goes into that too, that I think we get snippets of in the post-game interview, but that is just so much better. And the quality of filmmaking now is just so high. And the mm. and and I think the other piece of this, 
that is a, a, a major shift that we haven't even touched on. We could do an entire show on this, Jordan. Like yeah. the other thing that we haven't talked about here is just sports enterprises willing to even do this because traditionally sports like hockey or sports like golf have been really conservative, have been really closed lipped, have really tried to control their own messages and control their own narratives. And I think what drive to survive has shown is that even the ugly is good for you. If people are watching uh, and, and, and making an enemy out of Max Verstappen, they're going to tune in next Sunday at that race to watch him lose. Or if you're like me and you like enemies in sports, you're going to tune in to cheer for him because you get to say long live Red Bull on the on the show every Sunday. Win, right? There's 100%. there's this added sort of thing to it that that, that uh, this of accessibility that is uh, that is really I think great for sports, great uh, for fans, and for fans of documentaries. I know you are. I'm a big document uh, documentary fan likely my favorite genre of movie i i just love it and i've been loving all of this content and multi-episode now you can do multi-episode whereas you have to pack everything into an hour and a half or two hours you know like there's so much more you can do with it there's so much creativity and these are great stories interesting people it's like it was a no-brainer but you know someone figured it out netflix and now now this is where we're at right so why don't we just do this and this is off your top of your head but Let's do a little hat trick throw out here. So can you name three documentaries if you of these sports docs you were going to recommend to somebody? What would be the ones that come to mind first? What would be your first one? I've got a couple here. If you want a second to think, I can do mine first. Do yours first. Okay. So I've got three. As I said, it's a hat trick. So the first one, I would also argue, I, I mentioned uh, 30 for 30 as kind of like what I consider in many ways, like the originator of this um, format. I think it's definitely like, a template that a lot of these documentaries now have followed. If you're, if it's one of the more, as I kind of called them retrospective style docs where it's not the embedded one so much, but the original original of this is hoop dreams, which is a series around a couple of basketball players growing up. And it's a really, really good documentary series. So I would recommend hoop dreams. My second one, I will go with a 30 for 30. It's actually the original 30 for 30, the very first one ever produced and released It's directed by Peter Berg. Uh, and it is called a King's ransom. It, you can find it, I think, on ESPN's platforms, or I think TSN has these now too, which is pretty cool. That one's really, really good um, because, again, it follows. It, it sort of it looks back at the at the trade Wayne Gretzky to the LA Kings. Obviously, really, really interesting access. He's got Peter Pocklington in there. The really funny thing about this documentary is the interview with Gretzky is done at a driving range. Peter Berg and him are literally just shagging balls and talking about this story. So it's kind of a funny format, but it's a really good documentary. And if you're an Oilers fan, uh, there's some great old eighties Edmonton footage. Um, and then the last one I was going to say, because I think it's really fun is on Disney plus and it's Wrexham FC, which is an embedded one. So this is like the drive to survivor, one of those ones. And this is the story of this bottom of the table, bottom of bottom tier of English football team in Scotland or pardon me in Wales. Oh, wow, I just committed a massive sin there, but in Wales uh, that was purchased by, um, uh, Ryan Reynolds and, and another Hollywood actor who I can't remember his name, but Ryan Reynolds is one of the two guys. They bought this little failing team and they've done their best to try to resuscitate it and bring it back from the bottom of the table and get it promoted to a higher team. And it's a really charming and really fun little story about these two Americans who knew nothing about football, but really want it to succeed. And they, they just, it's a really beautiful little documentary about this small town that is desperately um, in love with this tiny little football club. And it's sort of the heartbeat of this little hamlet or this little village. And uh, it's really, it's actually really charming. So that one's on Disney plus that one's uh, called Rex MFC. Elliot, what are your three? Yeah, so mine are definitely a different flavor. I tend to like controversy and I love scandal. So that's where my heart goes. Um, so the first two were that. One of my favorite documentaries of all time is a documentary called Icarus, which highlights the Russian doping scandal and goes through. Uh, and part of it is just the access this guy gets. Yeah, um, it's phenomenal. It, it's like phenomenal. He, he speaks to the head of the Russian anti-doping association that was basically responsible for uh, the cheating at the Olympics. And um, uh, the guy is basically dead man walking and telling his story. And it's it's incredible. And uh, what I loved about it and what I love about that documentary 
is the story evolves in front of the story maker or the, the, the filmmaker. And so he yeah. does it, like, he's going in doing something almost completely different. Like he's touching yeah. on coping, obviously, but the, the scandal as it emerges and he's got access to this guy. Cause he's doing this stuff from before. It's an outstanding documentary. I think it was nominated. It may have won. It won. Yeah. It won. So it was, it's an outstanding piece of documentary work. And it's such, it's one of those great, like the story fell into his lap, but he did everything right to make it happen cannot 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 uh speak more highly about uh icarus um fifa oh, uncovered, on netflix I, by the way on oh, netflix yeah fifa uncovered is the second one that uh, i would say i watched that over the holidays my sister and i actually just finished it tonight so maybe there's a little bit of recency bias around it but it will make you mad and um so just be pre-warned it's going to make you mad <laughs> but it uh, does a great job again access and this is another thing that I, I just love when filmmakers are able to get access set bladder is interviewed the current fifa president is interviewed all these people uh who are basically part of the fifa um uh, fraud scandal and corruption scandal that occurred uh around qatar and, and russia and, and and it does a great job I, what i loved about it is it does a great job of articulating the backstory of how russia uh, fifa was uh, created and where in the 1970s around 1974 uh things change and uh the way in which money is filtered changes it's it's really great and it's really i think coming out of the world cup thinking about the future of soccer in this world it's really worth watching for any soccer fan but sports fan in general too so those are my first two the controversial ones the other one i really love is last chance you uh, which highlights stories uh, from a, a college that is basically takes up, uh, takes in uh, players that have gotten into trouble that were supposed to be college stars, but have done something wrong in their lives uh, and got kicked out of the big programs. Uh, and it basically chronicles this team, which is a division two school, but that has a reputation of rehabilitating brands and, and images of players, college players that made mistakes and um, and basically tells a story of this team and the challenges that they face. And when you've got a lot of big personalities in the room, what happens? It also does a great job of uncovering the corruption or the mess that is the U.S. college system for athletes. Um, but finally, I think the last thing it does, too, is really show the stakes for some of these kids and what's, you know, the, 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 the communities that they're leaving, the life situations that they're leaving. Um, and, and that football is really their only, for many of them, the only pathway to success and their lives are going to be remarkably different and really quite terrible. And, and so last chance you was, I, I think is a really good uh, uh, glimpse into U S college sports Americana that I, that I love as well. Yeah, you've given me one more here that I just want to give an honorable mention to because it's a companion to that. Uh, it's a step further back. It's about high school football. It won the Oscar in 2012. So the other one is Undefeated, which is about the Manassas Tigers in Memphis. And again, it's a very similar story. It's a down on its luck kind of high school that has a lot of uh, kids who come from a difficult background. And this football program run by Bill Courtney really ha became a safe space, let's call it for a lot of these young athletes. So again, that's a, I would just give that an honorable mention undefeated, but yeah, those are some great recommendations. Thanks, Elliot. And uh, again, maybe we will come back to this conversation as uh, some of these documentaries keep landing on Netflix and other things. And obviously, as you said, you know, they, they become more and more part of the overall sports narrative because they reveal things we didn't previously know. There's some, you know, sometimes there's some tea spilled and there's also some, uh, you know, I don't know, interesting opportunities for people to get closer to the athletes and the teams that they're interested in, which is, I guess, why they're being produced in the first place, or to uncover some of the corruption in sports, which is something we enjoy doing here too. All right. Thanks, Elliot. Uh, great episode. And thanks everybody for listening. We appreciate it. Um, if you haven't already, head over to the Ordinary Podcasting Network's website. That's ordinarypodcasts.com. Um, you can find out all about the different shows on the network. And also there are new items dropping in our merch store over the next couple of weeks. Go check that out. There's some stuff from running down the clock that's already up there. Um, there'll be some new stuff landing shortly for uh, some of our other podcasts. So definitely go check that out if you haven't already. You can follow us on Instagram as well. And uh, please, please, if you don't already, please subscribe. It, uh, it, it always helps to have your support. We uh, love the feedback we get. We really appreciate it, guys, for listening. So thanks so much. That was happy. Patrick is a member of the Ordinary Podcasting Network. It's produced every week by Jordan Dyler-Coltman and Braden Dyler-Coltman. 
can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks for listening. Thanks, buddy. All right. Good night. Good night. See ya. The Ordinary Podcasting Network wishes to acknowledge that the lands on which our conversations take place include Treaty 6 territory, the traditional meeting ground and home for many indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and the Nakota Sioux peoples, as well as the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. And we extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live, create, and share stories on these territories. The Ordinary Podcasting Network intends to engage in conversations and dialogue, which acknowledge that reconciliation is not a destination, but a journey, and that we remain committed to practicing our craft in a decolonized space.